Hello, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this afternoon's webinar. My name is Seth, and I'm a trustee of the Philippine Reef and Rainforest Conservation Foundation, and I will be moderating this afternoon. And with me also in the background is uh, Dave, Kim, and Erin, who will be helping us with uh, the technical stuff. So PRRCFI, or Philippine Reef Rainforest Conservation Foundation, is a nonprofit or NGO behind the Nugan Island. And uh, the Nugan Island is a sanctuary in Southern Negros, where our team has been running marine and wildlife camps for the last 30 years. So of course, with the pandemic, we are not able to run our annual camps. So we are really happy that we are still able to do the camps virtually through Zoom. And I'd like to take um, this opportunity to thank our president, Jerry Ledesma, for making these virtual camps possible. So we're actually now on season two of our camps. Um, we ran season one um, a couple weeks ago, and season two has six sessions. And yesterday, we talked about the life of a wildlife biologist. And today, we are on the fifth session of the series, and it is entitled Shrimp Gobies, a Fascinating Partnership in the Ocean. But before that, I'll just go through a few guidelines for our webinar, especially for the first timers. So you will notice that um, you will only be able to see and hear myself and the panelists. Uh, you will not be able to see or hear each other. So we will only interact through the chat box. And you can also um, post your questions in the chat box. And if you have any technical issues, you can also. Um, flag them there. So why don't we test the chat box for those who are already here. We have about 93 people in the room. Maybe you can just say uh, hello or good afternoon in your dialect and also let us know where you are joining us from, like what city or country. Okay, somebody from Davao, oh, Melbourne, good eye mites, oh, and Sydney, Sydney too. Sri Lanka, Mayim Hapon from Cebu. Great. Thanks, guys. Naga City, Subic. Great. So it looks like the chat um, box is working well. So we are going to try our best to answer your questions at the end of the presentation. But if we run out of time, don't worry. 
We will also um, ask our resource person to answer the questions offline and we will be emailing this to you together with the recording of this webinar. Okay, so again, the webinar is brought to you by the Philippine Reef and Rainforest Conservation Foundation, the team behind Danhugan Island. Okay. So in our camps, we're always fascinated by marine animals, how they behave in the wild, you know, how, they, the diff how the different species relate with each other and even depend on each other. So our speaker today, um, I'll just give a quick introduction. Our speaker today is Dr. Klaus Stiefel. He may not look Filipino, and that's because he's not. <laughs> he's actually from Austria, but he has lived in Dumaguete for about four years now. So I think Klaus will be joining us in a bit. So Klaus did his undergraduate in microbiology at the University of Vienna and his doctorate in zoology. Hi, Klaus. Um, his doctorate in zoology at the University of Vienna and the Max Planck Institute for Brain Research in Frankfurt. Research stints in California, Japan, and Australia followed. Klaus scientific interests are neurobiology, evolutionary biology, and marine biology, especially the biology of gobies, small marine fishes. Klaus currently lives in the Philippines as a scuba instructor, underwater photographer, author, and independent scientist. So hi, Klaus. How are you? Hello. Mayang buntag, mayang hapon. Kamusta dyan sa Dumaguete? Mayang hapon, init tayo sa Dumaguete. Wow, your Bisaya is so good. So before we start, Klaus, I'm just going to share. There was a poll that you guys answered at the start when you joined in the webinar. And the question was, what is your most favorite symbiosis? Okay, so I'm just going to read the results. So the number one answer is clownfish and sea anemone, okay? That's like 40, almost half of them said that. And then the next top answer is sharks and shark suckers or remoras. And then following closely is your favorite, Klaus, shrimp and gobies. And then a few said that they like the cleaner wrasse and parrot, parrotfish partnership. And then we did have a few, about 5%, that said that they don't know what symbiosis is. Okay? So yeah, we will explain. Yes, you will explain, <laughs> not me. <laughs> so, um, okay. Yeah. okay, so yeah, let's start. Take it away. You can now um, share your screen. Okay. You see my screen? I see it. Okay, perfect. So. Thank you for having me. I would rather be in Danhugan, of course, but uh, given the circumstances, you know, this is a very good second best. So um, let's, uh, most of you know what a, a symbiosis is, or a mutualist symbiosis, but still let's go over the, the concept, the principle again. So most of you probably know this symbiosis, which is the, uh, the, a clownfish, the an, uh, anemone fish, which is a type of damselfish, they live in, um, in anemones. They protect their host anemones fiercely open, uh, often. They uh, protect them to the point that they will, will attack divers, which are probably a thousand times their body mass. And they got get a lot of protection from the anemones. So uh, there is a uh, advantage for both the fish, which is protected by the anemone, and the anemone, which is protected by the fish. So uh, the advantage is mutual, and this makes it a mutualist symbiosis. Um, it's, there are other cases, and this is actually a really fascinating symbiosis, which if you dive carefully, you will be able to observe this. So uh, this is where the clean fish uh, which is a ras. This is this uh, elongated fish with um, with a black stripe and uh, you know yellow and blue body color. Uh, these fish approach other fish, sometimes much larger than them, as in the case of this lizard fish here, and scan their bodies for 
or for parasites, uh, for, uh, for fungus infections, and uh, nip them off. Again, both partners have an advantage. Uh, they obviously the the canyon fish uh, get cleaned off, uh, you know, otherwise harmful parasites, and these parasites are a, a you know a very rich meal for the cleaner races. Um, interestingly, sometimes the cleaner races cheat. They would uh, take a little bit of mucus, uh, you know, or uh, fish uh, scales, and and not uh, remove parasites. So it's, it's a fine line for this fish when they should cheat and when they should be honest. Uh, because they have to, you know, thread this fine line, they have evolved to be me, uh, extremely clever fish. Um, they're, they're among the few animals which can recognize themselves in a mirror, uh, um, interestingly. So, uh, you know, this is, this is another symbiosis where, uh, in most cases, at least, both sides profit. Then we have, you know, I think that also got a lot of votes. We have the shark suckers or the moors. So on the right side, you see them attached to a whale shark. On the left side, you can see, uh, maybe you can, you can, uh, you know, uh, Guess in the chat window what the uh, Gemora is attached, the shark sucker is attached here. So I can't quite see the chat window. Yeah, they are, the solution is, uh, is me. So these fish are so eager to be attached to uh, larger fish or dolphins or even divers that, you know, that they would even sometimes take divers, which are not very uh, quick, of course. Now, What's the benefit for the, uh, the shark? They're also parasite removers. What is the advantage for the uh, shark sucker or remora? The advantage is they, uh, again, they, you know, they get to eat the, um, the parasites. They might get leftovers from a shark. And there was called hydrodynamic parasites. So they get a free ride. It's very energy efficient, uh, you know, energy costly to swim. So if you get uh, if you get to uh, be taken to other spots by the swimming of a shark, that's a big deal. Now uh, you know we just had uh, like a pretty fun discussion uh, yesterday, and we uh, decided to include one more case of where um, you know different animals in the ocean live together. Now what we have here. What we can, you can probably guess are the, the anuses of sea cucumbers. And there are actually fish which live in these anuses. So there is a fish which lives exclusively in, in the butt of sea cucumbers. Now, um, this is not really a symbiosis because there's no advantage for the sea cucumber. Um, there are cases where the, these fish, they put pearl fish, actually feed on the intestines of the sea, sea cucumber. Then they become parasites. In most cases, however, they just use the sea cucumbers as a very sturdy oral, basically, as a, as a place to escape from dangerous predators. And then they, they, uh, they're what's called a commensalists. So there's advantage for one side, for the, for the pearl fish, there's no advantage for the sea cucumber. So it, it's a one-sided interaction. But what we want to talk about today is, is another of these proper mutually symbioses, which is the interaction between shrimp and the, um, the shrimp goby. Now, you, uh, on this image on the right, you can see the goby. So a goby is a small, typically bottom living fish. There are gobies in the ocean, there are freshwater gobies. There are a total of almost 2,000 species of gobies. So, a, you know, they're an extremely diverse family of fishes. And of these almost 2,000 gobies, about 120 species have acquired a trick. And this is the trick they have acquired. They, they keep themselves a shrimp. And they keep the shrimp like humans would keep uh, a water buffalo as, as a 
a pet animal. And uh, now, what does the, the shrimp do in this mutually symbiosis? The shrimp digs a burrow. Both animals can hide in that burrow and you know, can escape the many dangerous predatory fishes which we have on coral reefs. Uh, what does the, however, you know, it's again, as, as I said, it's a mutually symbiosis here. What does the goby do? The goby acts as a watchman. So if you uh, see these pictures, this picture, I hope you can see it well, these white spots here, these are the eyes of the shrimp. So the shrimp is not blind, but it's, it's I said is very, very poor. In contrast, the goby actually has really large eyes uh, for a small fish, and we will come back to that. And um, the, um, so the goby sits at the entrance of this burrow and uh, acts as a watchman, as a guard. Whenever a large predatory fish uh, approaches, it will either flick its tail or just quickly escape back into the burrow. And, and that uh, behavior is, um, you, you know, tails the shrimp, you know, it's really dangerous now, I, I want to stay underground. So then, you know, for a couple of minutes, the shrimp and the goby stay in, uh, in quarantine. They, they don't leave the burrow. Um, okay, so this is from a really well done study by Ethan Karplus, who is one of the pioneers of the shrimp goby, of shrimp goby science. So this study is from 1971, I believe. Um, what he did, he would fill these burrows with acrylic and then dig them up. And so you could see that this tiny shrimp with a tiny brain is nevertheless, a, it's, a, it's a good engineer. So you can see there's an open funnel, then there, you know, there's a, uh, a walkway, there is a, uh, a chamber, then there's another chamber here. And very often what the shrimp also do, they use um, corals or uh, dead, you know, ro stones or dead rocks uh, as ceilings. So these are very clever constructions which the shrimp build for the benefit of both the goby and the shrimp. You can also see that here. So these are uh, pictures I took. I think I believe this is from Malapaspa. Here again, you see the the fish, the shrimp goby, and you see the shrimp coming out of the burrow entrance. And this shrimp here used these uh, these flat stones slab as a as a burrow entrance. So sometimes these entrances are really reminiscent of you know medieval romantic uh, churches in Europe in, in, in the way of how they're you know, cleverly using the stones to, you know, the, to make the entrances stable. Here this is a different species of shrimp goby and the um, shrimp is coming out in the back. You can also see hopefully on these pictures that the antenna of the shrimp are always in touch with the goby. So this is how they keep the, the communication going quite interesting to me. Now, important question. The, you know, there is no tin on the water. So how do the partners find each other? Uh, you know, the goby uh, would, would hatch from an egg. It would then spend typically a week or a little bit more in the water column as a larva. And then how would it then go, um, you know, once it settles as an adult fish, in the sand, how would it find a proper shrimp? Now, it, it turns out that the goby first looks for a proper burrow entrance, which it inspects for, you know, the right style, the right size. Then it looks at the patterning on the, uh, on the carpets of the shrimp. Now, in, in contrast, the shrimp, which I've, I've mentioned that, it has poor eyesight, so, it smells out the, the correct goby. So, the, so this is how the two partners in this symbiosis establish their relationship initially. Uh, the goby at the bottom is a fantastic, fantastic specimen. It's a, uh, the genus is Tomiyamuchis, and this is a picture I took in uh, Anilao a few years ago. So, you know, this is really the, the charm of diving in the Philippines to me, that you, you see these amazing, rare, small fish.
Now, let's come back to the communication system. Uh, here we, you know, in uh, the, there's a white shrimp gobi, orange bars, which is um, a Randall shrimp gobi, and it, um, this shrimp gobi has uh, a shrimp, which, you know, here you can see it's in touch with the ghost body at all times when it's coming out of the burrow. And uh, it's usually touching the, the unpaired fins, which are the uh, dorsal fins, the caudal fin, or the anal fin of the gobi. Now, the, there is this, we will see that in a video in a minute. There is this, uh, you know, nervous flick, which is kind of an orange warning, or there's a full-blown escape of the gobi into the burrow, which is a red warning. So, so this is how, how these animals communicate. I think this is really fascinating, you know, how, the, how this evolved. And, and it's uh, even more fascinating because this evolved twice. Now, um, what do I mean by that? So, so the, the answer of all of these shrimp goals, it was not uh, uh, working together with the shrimp, right? So in uh, this uh, happens, this partnership got established, a couple million years ago uh, in the, in the Indo-Pacific, where these gobies, which generally have the tendency to like to go into burrows, they would then, uh, you know, find shrimp, which, you know, have the tendency to dig burrows, and uh, they would part now. Now, this happened in two independent groups of gobies, and one of these groups is typically called the reef shrimp gobies, and the other group are called the silt shrimp gobies. And the, you know the, the last common ancestor of these two, uh, uh, you know, shrimp gobi groups was a solitary gobi without the shrimp. So you know this is such a useful partnership for both that you know the, this evolutionary accident, this you know event happened twice. I think that's really fascinating. So what you know what you see here on the on the side is basically the the family tree of all uh, gobies in the in the Indo-Pacific, where you have, you know, like a big uh, branch of the family, which are solitary gobies. Then you have the reef shrimp gobies. In between, are again, solitary gobies. And then here, the, the silt shrimp gobies. Now, you might ask, how can you observe this? Or, or how can I even photograph or film that? You, you might be a diver. Uh, or a snorkeler, and you might never have seen this. Well, that's possible because and they, they're, uh, they're very, very freaky animal, uh, animals. So if you swim in a, in, a, in, a, in a way that you splash around, or your buoyancy is not very good, then what's going to happen is that uh, you will scare the shrimp away, and the shrimp away will go in the burrow, and, and that will be the end of it. Uh, you know, you will need the shrimp of the shrimp gobi will stay there for anywhere between you know two minutes and half an hour so what you have to do you have to uh have a very very careful approach you know keep your buoyancy in order don't move your hands you know uh and when you see the go get a little bit nervous stop the point also uh this is a very successful symbiosis so the this uh Teamwork has allowed them to work together in a way that they, uh, there are lots of individuals of these uh, shrimp gobies. So if you're in a sandy area on a dive site, there is probably one shrimp shrimp goby pair per square meter. And um, so if you scare one pair, just you know, get your points in order and, and look for the next. Now, can we get the videos, please? Thank you very much. So, this is some footage I shot during the last three years in the north of the Philippines in Bulinao, in the Pangasinan province. And uh, so, here you can see there is one of these shrimp gobies. There's this funnel-like entrance, and in the back, there's a shrimp coming out. Uh, here, this is a close-up onto, uh, onto the face of the shrimp gobi. 
I think these are fantastically beautiful animals. Yeah, look at this, like a psychedelic, uh, uh, yeah, interesting questions. Um, so there is, um, you know, it's like a psychedelic clown makeup. I, I, interesting question, just thought I will answer it later. Um, so here is an, you know, this scoby is perching at the entrance. Um, yeah, no, no, it's not all species. About 10% of all goby species act like this. Now, here is yet a different goby species. Again, please appreciate the, you know, the interesting arrangements of these little rocks which they should build at the entrance. And, you know, uh, this is another effect which we observe that the shrimp goby seem to be communicating with each other by changing the color of the eye crest. So look at, look at the eyes of this shrimp goby. Now, what we have here, this is a 10 times slow motion recording of how a, you know, there's a sand perch approaching and the shrimp goby escaped. Um, yeah, and then there is a, Yet another shrimp goby, you know, signaling to a neighboring. Uh, uh, so I just saw your question. I will answer them right after the videos. So here the goby is escaping. Here is another close up. Now, this is a species called Myrcina lachnagi, which a uh, year ago, with my colleagues at the University of the Philippines and I, described for the first time in the Philippines. So this is a really rare fish. I'm actually quite excited about this footage. And uh, this species hovers in, in front of its core. It does not uh, try to, it does not sit in the sand. Okay, so I think Maybe we can we can stop this video for a second, and I can answer the questions. Can we do that, please, Dave? Yes. Yeah, so, ah, oh, no, I guess the video is rolling. That's fine. Um, ah, okay, perfect. So, one question was: Are the droppings uh, of the goby food for the shrimp? Yes, I believe so. It's the droppings and its material which the goby are collect, which the shrimp collects from around the borough. So if you artificially go to a sandy area and, and remove the gobies, what will happen is that the shrimp will mainly stay underground and the, the growth will be much slower. Uh, also, if you do the opposite experiment, if you place the shrimp gobies in a sandy area without shrimp, what will happen is that within days, they will be annihilated. They will be eaten by predatory fish. Uh, there was another question, so does every goby do this? No. So out of approximately 1,800 species of gobies, about 120 uh, species do this. So it's, it's a, a minority uh, program, basically. And I think the last question was, um, how do you find them? Um, well, so again, you know, swim very carefully and look for all shaped holes. So, you know, these openings to this, um, yeah, please do a screenshot. The openings to these shrimp goby burrows, they do not look like something which is built either by a worm or like something which is just created by the current. So these, you know, you know like imagine the, remember I, I pointed out these little rocks, which are almost like a, a romantic arch. And um, look for that. I think, I think that's, a good, um, that's a good way of finding the boros. Thank you, can we continue with the video please? Yeah, so this is a video I shot in Darwin on Negros Island. So here you see a rare excursion 
where the Toby, I believe, it, you know, because it opened its mouth, it went over to threaten a neighboring Toby. So this is typically, this is a, a dominant signal. You know, opening a mouth for a fish is like, you know, pounding your chest for, for a gorilla. Um, so here it returns to the photo. Now I shot this uh, by just placing the camera in the sand. Because as I said, you know, these this animals are so freaky that, you know, if you're actually there as a diver, they're easy to scare. And in this video, I, I like this video because it demonstrates this uh, escape. Yeah, here comes the goby, uh, the shrimp out of the burrow. Uh, thank you. Uh, and then the, um, the, yeah, the question is, can we see shrimp and gobies in Philippine coastal areas? Yes. Almost in every area, actually even in areas which are rather polluted and, uh, you know, overfished. Uh, shrimp cove is always there, interestingly. Now, what I like about this video is that I'm demonstrating the escape reflex. So you can see the partnership very well, right? The uh, shrimp is working hard. Um, and then the, um, the gobi is a watchman. And here comes a diver, and that is me. Before I cut my hair really short. <laughs> and you can see that the goby does notice me, it's retreating, but it, it considers me a, a minor threat. So it's not escaping yet. So, you know, normally, you know, I really want to be respectful of marine life and, you know, but uh, this is an exception. I'm, I'm really like demonstrating an interesting type of behavior. So that's why I, you will see me in a second raising my hand here. Uh, to demonstrate the escape reflex. Oof. You see this big cloud of sand. Uh, that just, it takes about um, a tenth of a second. It takes about a hundred milliseconds only for the Gobi to escape. So thank you for the videos. I think I, I will go back to sharing my screen. There we go. So, I, my lovely colleagues, who are both really nice people and very good scientists at the University of the Philippines, Tilleman, and also uh, at Rudy Los Banos, uh, Rudy Ruiz, um, together with me, have essentially tried to look at two questions. And I will give you a, a quick overview over the research we have been doing. So. Shouldn't the shrimp goby's eyes be bigger? Bigger. Now, this is a headshot of one of these uh, shrimp goby's. These are guys. Now, you know, like uh, take, you know, imagine this was a human. You would have, you know, coffee, uh, you know, cup, plates, sized eyes. If your eyes were as big as these in, in relation to your head. And, and the eye is expensive. What, what do I mean by that? Uh, it costs a lot of biological energy to make an eye in, in uh, you know, embryonic development. And uh, the, the, up, uh, the upkeep of the retina is very uh, energetically expensive. There have been, you know, uh, calculations for another animal with big eyes, which is a uh, housefly. And about a third of the energy which a housefly consumes goes into the upkeep of its eye, you know, because this, uh, you know, detecting light is a very energetically costly process. Now, um, uh, so goby is already a uh, small fish with big eyes, but in contrast to these free living gobies, uh, these shrimp gobies are even more than visual specialists. So what they do all day, pretty much, they sit in front of the burrow and look. They look for predators. And for them to look closely uh, is a life and death uh, situation, not just for themselves, but for themselves and their shrimp. So 
The question is, wouldn't the shrimp gobies have relatively bigger eyes than gobies without shrimp? Now, um, without showing you a lot of graphs and statistics, we did a, a very thorough analysis of an ADA, which is called fish base, and the answer was no. So, you know, even regular gobies have very big eyes. They don't need bigger eyes to become shrimp gobies, so they were essentially already predestined to, uh, you know, to, to be become visual specialists. The second research project is we were filming shrimp gobies in the field and we were studying their behavior. So this we also did in Bulinao in the north of the Philippines. It's about a seven or eight hour bus ride north of Manila, and that's a long bus ride, believe me. And so what we did, we had these plastic scaffolds where we had a GoPro camera um, you know, attached. And this GoPro camera would film about a square meter of area around the uh the you know the burrow entrance and then we you know we check when does the shrimp appear when it does it leave where does the go we move all of these things and uh we did recordings for each go we between 20 minutes and an hour and what did we find so you know we we this is a software analysis we did of this behavior it was very uh time consuming um we we looked at the gobies. We looked, you know, um, we looked at the good, the bad, and the ugly, which is, you know, the goby and uh, the shrimp, and, and the bad is the sand perch because, uh, you know, so what you're seeing here is a sand perch, which is a sand living fish, which is probably, you know, between ten and twenty five centimeters in length. When scientists have caught them and examined their stomach contents, they found a significant number of these, let's say, shrimp, you know, the shrimp which live with gobies. So, for shrimp and for shrimp gobies. And, you know, how do the shrimp gobies await this? Now, essentially what we found, most of the time of the day, the shrimp gobies would be rather stationary. They would be very conservative. They would be very close next uh, to their the borough entrance, and uh, their excursions would not be very far. So, you know, this is uh, some data. So, what you see on the axis is, is time. So, this is about um, 15 minutes, and um, what you see on the y axis is the, how far is the gobi from the borough. So this is in millimeters. So the furthest it, uh, it moved away from the borough was only 10 centimeters. And you know, this is very close even for a small fish. So here you can see the goby got, got you know, a little bit more adventurous and it moved away. For many minutes it didn't move at all. The gray blocks are episodes when the shrimp appeared. Now at one point, one of these evil sand perches uh, appeared and that's the red block and you can see for several minutes before and afterwards the shrimp and the goby remained in the borough underground and so basically the, the goby spotted the sand perch from far away even before you know it entered the field of view of our camera both animals then went into hiding and only uh, you know several minutes after the sand perch had left uh, it's uh, come out again uh, from the borough. Now, remember that I told you that there is two, uh, you know, family branches of um, go of shrimp gobies. So, in, we investigated the difference between the, the reef uh, shrimp gobies and the silk silk shrimp gobies. We also investigated two sites in our uh, you know research area and one was about only about two meters deep in seagrass and the other one was about 18 meters deep and that was a reef area with a lot of sand and then the um now the we found interesting differences and that sums it up so the the circles are the size of the home ranges when we were looking at solitary goalies goalies without a shrimp 
we found they had large, large home ranges. When we looked at reef shrimp pools, we found they had significantly smaller home ranges in the same environment, in that uh, you know, research site, which was two meters deep, uh, the, um, we, the Siltrin Gobies had much smaller home ranges. Now, when we moved to the deeper side, we found almost no reef shrimp gobies, but we found several Siltrin Gobies. All of a sudden, their, um, the home range was much bigger. Why is that the case? We think it's because there are fewer bedrides. We found that there are about 10 times more of these sand perches. You can see that on the side, on the deep side, as uh, you know, compared to, on the shallow side, as compared to the deep side. So on average, there were about six and, and a half of these sand perches in the shallow side at two meters, where there was less, on average, less than one perch per 100 square meters in the deep side. So, you know, uh, what's, my, what's the take home message here? These are small fish with small brains, but they're nevertheless clever animals. They assess their environment, and when there is less of a threat, when there are fewer predators, they expand their, their home ranges. Small fish, small brains, complex behaviors. Now, I'm almost done. I would like to mention two things. Three things. I would like, yeah, my uh, colleagues from the University of the Philippines, great people. It's, it's a lot of fun to uh, do research there. I would like to mention that uh, there's a web page I've set up um, with the help of a nice small science communication grant from a NGO called uh, Two Photon Science. And uh, there is a commission, the Filipina artists. Miss Chera Guinto, who uh, uh, even drew a shrimp gobi cartoon, and you can find all of that and more on on the shrimp gobi page. So, just it's it's a part of my blog. And another thing I want to mention, uh, they are coming very soon with Pata Morgana Press, which is a publisher in Manila. Uh, is my uh, book about gobies, which will be called Gobies of the Tropics. So I hope you enjoyed all of that, and I'm very happy to answer any goby or shrimp or shrimp goby related questions you have. Wow, thank you so much, Klaus. My I pleasure. love the videos. Okay, so we have a, quite a number of questions here for you. I'm gonna try to kind of group them. Okay, so the first set of questions is about, um, okay, when, the question is, when do the shrimp and gobies first meet and then become symbiotically related or in what part of their life cycle do they get together? Wow. Yeah, yeah, no, a very important question. Um, the, very early in their lives, so the goby, you know, it spends the first approximately two weeks of its life as a larva in, and, uh, in the water column. Then it would settle in the sand. And then there are essentially two options. Either it would find a shrimp with a burrow or it would get eaten. And so, um, yeah, there have been experiments where people would essentially, you know, introduce extra gobies um, in, in a seagrass area, and, and they did not have very long survival times. It, it was days, basically. Same thing for the shrimp. I mean, the shrimp would have a better survival time, but it would just not flourish. So there is essentially a very little time which these animals spend in, you know, before they find a partner. Okay, and so related to that question is, do they change partners or are they partners for life? Uh, well, uh, also a very interesting, right? And so it's very unsentimental. I mean, the gobies, the gobies get eaten. And I, I, have, I have repeatedly seen observed cases 
where there was a rather large shrimp and, and a small goby. So how could that have happened? A larger goby would have died and then a new goby would have taken up that forest. Um, there is very interestingly, there is one species in the Caribbean where the, uh, where the gobies are essentially promiscuous. So they would go, they would change shrimp parts. Uh, that is, that does not happen in the Indo-Pacific. Mm, it's interesting that you say that because there's some questions on what is the ratio of the symbiotic relationship, one goby is to one shrimp. Um, is it possible that another goby or shrimp steal the spot in the partnership? Yeah, yeah, no, very, very interesting, you know, very good questions. What's happening? Typically, there would actually be, and you don't see that, but there would be two shrimps, and they would, they would leave the borough in an alternating fashion. And they would, they would then breach in that borough, and you, you remember these, um, the chambers in the borough, these are for shrimp eggs, pretty much. Now, uh, some, mostly you will find a single goby per borough, Sometimes there are two. It's not very critical for the gobies to have a mate in the same burrow because very frequently the next shrimp goby burrow is you know, less than a meter away. So if they if they want to mate, uh, they can actually. You know, it's not very far. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna move on to some questions about photography. Mm -hmm. So, um, like, what are your, some of your tips to locate gobies, to like, yeah. take photos and videos of them? And, you know, how, well, they, we, have, we saw the video of you diving with one, but, like, yeah. what, what are some tips on, like, photographing gobies? Yeah, so, really, you know, very calm behavior is, is number one. Then, uh, number two, so I'm a paddy instructor. So I, I'm, I'm obliged to tell you the number one rule of scuba diving is don't hold your breath. But if you want to photograph shrimp gobies, <laughs> I heard from a friend of a friend that you should hold your breath because, because the exhalation noise just, uh, you know, disturbs this. Obviously, you, 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 you can't go up, right? You will get lung damage if you go up. But if, you, if you're stationary, you will. Um, that will not happen. So, or, you know, exhale very calmly uh, through your mask, which generally generates uh, smaller bubbles and it causes less disturbance uh, to the shrimp goby. Another tip is you just you know, I mean, you are not photographing the goby, you're working with the goby. So if the goby doesn't want to be photographed, there's nothing you can do. And you just have to find a different, you know, I've, I've sometimes spent 10 minutes with a sim, single shrimp goby. Sometimes I would approach a borrow and they would immediately disappear. So it's very hard to, it's daily form of these gobies, basically. Oh, there's a question here about, you know, that slide you had with the, with the burrow? Yeah. What equipment was used to map it? Yeah. So, um, you know, don't, don't try this at home, right? Uh, <laughs> it was acrylic. <laughs> now, you know, it was done in 1970s. And so, and number, number two, the, you know, they had a scientific permit for that. It was in, in Israel, right, in, uh, in the Red Sea. And uh, so they would essentially mix acrylic and then take a big syringe and fill the burrow. Uh, this would, without any doubt, kill the shrimp. And, uh, but, yeah, you know, that's what they did. And then they, they would wait a while till the acrylic had hardened. And then they would dig it up. So it's, it was pretty destructive research. But, you know, yeah. you don't want to do this all the time. But, you know, for one study to really see what's going on there. I have actually thought of getting like a, you know, an endoscope, like the kind mm. of stuff which goes up your nose. And if you go to <laughs> a nose problem. And, and you, um, stick, you stick it inside the... Yes, the I, I have thought oral? about that. Really? Yep. I, um, you know, then 
places on my to-do list. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, the, uh, it's going to be really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe you can share with us <laughs> when you do that. Okay, yeah, I think, for sure. I think this next question is uh, maybe this person is hungry. <laughs> That's why they asked this question. Um, can gobies be eaten by humans? And actually, some somebody answered that some <laughs> species are edible. So yeah. maybe you'd like to add to that. So, so, so let's say we are in the Philippines. Do you think there's anything in the ocean that's not to be eaten? <laughs> <laughs> yes, and there is. Uh, the shrimp gobies are too rare to be eaten, but there are brackish water gobies which are popular food fish in the north of the Philippines. I think the, um, the Locano name is Kura Ding Ding or Iposan. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I think Iposan is, means something like with long fin, right? So this is a species which is not associated with a shrimp and it's uh, the genus is Truptaupin. And when there is a heavy rain, they kind of leave their burrows and then you see them on the market. And then I think the way you cook them is, you know, you make this fish cake, you know, where you're like, you add an egg and then you fry them out. Have you? I, I, I don't, have you I, I don't, no, I don't eat meat. Fish, okay. fish are friends for me and not uh, food, but I'm not judging either. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see a few more questions here. Oh, how about okay? What are threats to gobies and um, something about are are they also kind of like a an indicator species? You know, this is again very thank you very interesting question. I've, I've actually thought about that a lot. Now, this region where a lot of the videos were shot, uh, that's in. Near for now in, in the Pangasinan province, and unfortunately, there is too much fish farming, which is named Bangos. So the ocean there is severely stressed by the by fish species, and um, all other fish have really disappeared, except for the gobies. So remember when when I showed the two different field sites, and one side had on average 0.7 predatory fish per 100 square meters. This, this shows that, you know, this is an extremely stressed piece of ocean. So in the, uh, like, uh, they're bizarrely, they're almost the opposite of an indicator species. They're so small that they're not worth fishing in most cases. And they're so hardy that unless you really have something like, you know, heavy metal pollution, that if you just have overfishing and you know runoff from uh, human development, you all fish will die, but you will still have gobies. Wow. Okay. Mm. Um, oh, this is an interesting question. Is there any predator that will follow them down the burrow, and if so, will how will they react? Well, also very interesting. In, uh, <laughs> no, the, uh, I don't think so. But there is actually there is a, a, a like a squatter, and um, there you know I should have really I will I think you will send around the uh, questions and answers. I will include a link. There okay. is something uh, there is something which is called a dart fish, which is actually it looks a little bit like an elongated goby. And they would sometimes use the burrow without paying rent. So, so they don't want the shrimp. They don't, they don't do anything useful in the symbiosis, but they will nevertheless live in the burrow with the shrimp and with the gobi. Okay, so maybe we can, do you want to answer more questions? Happy There's to do a that. a lot, yeah. 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 Happy to answer more questions. Are there gobies that eat shrimp? Um, <laughs> I I don't think there are, this has been shown. You know, like it, it and it just wouldn't work with um, the size of the goby mouth. I mean, they, they would eat crustaceans, right? But they, this oh. would be like um minute, uh, you know, like epipendic 
you know, sand living crustaceans, but the shrimp which live with them in the burrows, uh, they would just be out of their size range for food. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, this is a very, um, this next question is quite specific. Okay, you have to listen carefully, Klaus. Yeah. How do each species breed with their own? Do they get a room, get a room away from the burrow? Or do each of them allow partners to visit and get it on at the burrow? So, uh, so the way I understand it is that the shrimp just mate and lay eggs in this burrow um, uh, you know, chambers, right? Whereas the gobies, they would mate with neighboring gobies typically. In most goby species, it's typically the male which guards the eggs, which are attached to a piece of rock or coral. So that would be happening above ground. I'm almost certain. Wow, and some people are commenting that they like your new haircut. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's because of the karabi in it. Yes. <laughs> of the of the uh, heat <laughs> okay maybe we we can do one last question klaus mm -hmm. i've saved the best for last actually awesome and it's quite um how do you call it um you have to reflect a little bit on yep. it um what is it i found it a while ago oh wait wait wait, wait. let me just look for it Sorry, here it goes. Hmm. What does Cl Sir, what does Sir Klaus find most fascinating in symbiosis? And what can we learn from it as human beings? Well, you know, the, you can always come up with a nice storyline. But you know, this shrimp and the goby, they're very distantly related and um, you know, they nevertheless manage to collaborate, and hence so we as we are humans, we're all one, right? We should also collaborate. And I think I don't believe a second of that. I'm too much of a cynic. I think, uh, you know, whatever works, right? So it's actually very uh, pragmatic what they're doing. And then they're, uh, you know, essentially to me, what this teaches is just nature is just looking for advantages in the most in any ways it, it can get right and then you know you have these small animals which are defenseless and they would be eaten within days uh on a sandy plain but you know because they work together they've actually become really successful so i think to me it really teaches me that you know the creativity of evolution is just endless yeah, uh, earlier we were saying that we should evolve, you know, really in a, in a very positive way. Otherwise, you might end up in somebody's ass. <laughs> so like, like the ass fish. Like the ass fish and the sea cucumber. Okay, I hope I, I don't get to see that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I think that's um, all the time we have for the webinar. So thank you again so much, Klaus for joining us this afternoon and thank you so much for having me and again um as i mentioned earlier we will be answering we'll ask klaus to answer all of your questions and we will be emailing you the answers together with the recording of this webinar so thanks again mm -hmm. for listening everybody and please join us again tomorrow we have our last session tomorrow on seagrass so please join us again tomorrow thanks a lot bye, bye. I thought I could listen with you, but you weren't here, so I'm just